When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Kitties, it is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter, and tonight I'm turning in early. You see, I have an early start tomorrow, and I want to be well rested just after I enjoy my little nightcap of sleepy time tea and whiskey. Oh, you have trouble sleeping? Well, why didn't you say so? Usually, just listening to the rain of the valley hitting my rooftop is enough to lull me off to slumberland. But sometimes a little more is necessary. Booze, music, and perhaps even stories. In fact, I have a couple stories that just might do the job for you, oh guest of mine. The first one is all about sleep. Or rather, it's about one stressed out young man's inability to sleep. Despite his insomnia, he finds himself plagued by nightmares. Only these aren't hallucinations. These monsters are quite tangible, quite real. In fact, one might even be able to call them waking nightmares. Waking Nightmares by Teddy. Focus on your breathing. Silence your mind. Drink warm milk. Stay away from electronics. Keep the room dark. Take pills. All the ways the internet had told me to fall asleep. All oh, bullshit. For most everyone else, sleep is simple. Really, just lie down and suddenly eight hours have passed. Those people don't need to worry about what happens if they can't fall asleep. Not like me. Our entire existence boils down to the constant string of thought weaving its way through our heads. Our thoughts are what we are. But when you're left all alone with those thoughts, for hours and hours cut off from all external stimuli, that ever-present tiny little voice becomes something like torture. Very much like torture, in fact. I, I likened it to Chinese water torture, the practice of tying someone up and having a drop of water fall on their head at fixed intervals. Drip. Drip drip. It becomes a certainty. All that they can really focus on is the next drop of water. That's what it's like when I would try to sleep. One thought, and then another, and another, and another, never letting my mind rest. It had been like that for as long as I could remember. Even as a little child, I would lie awake in bed silently conversing with my stuffed animals. As I grew older, however, my insomnia became more of an issue. It held much more weight in my life than my old conversations with Mr. Teddy Bear. Of course, there were the obvious side effects. I lived like a zombie only half in touch with the world, 
My mind, in its ceaseless need to think, jumped around, never able to focus on one thought. I was honestly fine with that part. The part that I was not fine with were the things that stood in the corner of my bedroom when I couldn't sleep. People who sleep normally sometimes experience nightmares. Their own sleeping minds work against them to create terrifying situations. Monsters, spiders, murderers, there are no limits. The thing is, though, that those people wake up and their nightmares are gone. But my nightmares were real, physical things. They were different every time. I've had the typical fears. Giant spiders, clowns, chainsaw murderers and such. But every now and then I got creatures. Horrid abominations that were particularly unpleasant. They had ways beyond my understanding of keeping my room dark, of preventing lights from working, so I never got to make out more of their images than the moonlight would allow. The occurrences, my own twisted version of nightmares, had been happening ever since I moved into my own apartment. Nightmares are generally a result of stress, so my theory is that the stress of moving out on my own caused these nightmares, but somewhere along the line, something went wrong. My nightmares were not confined to my head. I didn't know why, I just knew that they were very real. The memory of the first time it ever happened is permanently engraved into my mind. How could I forget? It was the first week in my new apartment. I hadn't even unpacked and I was swamped with work from my new desk job, accounting. All of the stress led to another of the all-so-familiar sleepless nights. But it was distinctly different. Rather than tossing and turning, I found myself to be lying quite still under my thin covers, unable to focus on anything other than my newfound headache. Headache is probably not the best way to put it. Hammering migraine is a better term. Pulsating waves of pain radiated from my skull. Even the soft touch of my pillow was enough to set my teeth on edge. I had let out a groan of agony, and that seemed to be the start of it all. A crackling chuckle, <laughs> similar to that of a smoker, raspy and dry, came from out of the darkness in my room, responding to my pain. And just like that, my headache was gone. But it was replaced with a skin-chilling fear that led me to sit bolt upright. The chuckle continued. It came from the far corner, and I very much knew that I was not alone in my bedroom. It had been a cloudy night, so all I could do was squint into the darkness. Eventually, my eyes managed to make out the dark outline. It was a person. Sort of. I could make out two struts of curly hair shooting off the side of a bald head, all topped with a very tiny top hat. I didn't need to turn on my bedside lamp, which I was far too afraid to do regardless, to know that it was a clown. 
There had been a clown standing in the corner of my room, chuckling continuously. Hours went by as I watched him, but he never moved, and he never stopped that damn laugh. I hadn't slept much around that time, perhaps as little as four hours of sleep in the previous 48 hours, and that lack of sleep is what nearly got me killed. My thoughts were numb and out of focus, which is why at some point in the night, I managed to write off the clown silhouette in the corner as a fatigue-induced hallucination. With that conclusion easing my mind, it had been easy to eventually slip off into sleep. That sleep was short-lived. I was forced awake by a pair of gloved hands around my throat, and all I could manage to do was flail my arms around, doing absolutely nothing to remove the weight from my windpipe. My entire body burned, desperate for air, and I felt that I was not going to see the morning until a dim light briefly illuminated my window. It was a lone car. A solitary set of headlights driving past in the night. It saved my life. For the briefest of seconds, I could see the face of my assailant. All the paint of a clown with none of the charm. The entirety of his flesh was white as sheet completely contrasting the horrid splash of red around his mouth. Blood or paint, it was still disgusting. The eyes were the worst part. The cold pupils were almost impossible to make out under the murky layer of darkness covering the surface. But I could still tell they were looking directly at me as he crushed my throat. But the moment I saw him, in the flash of headlights, his grip released. All I could do was stare and try to suck in narrow breaths as the clown climbed off my bed and backed into his corner. Shakily, I sat up, never looking away from the clown, and I reached over to flick on my bedside lamp. The room remained dark. I hit the switch again and again, but the room remained dark. The clown once more began to chuckle. There was no way in hell that I could bring myself to move, to run, to call the police. All I did was sit and stare, and I could feel the clown stare back. It wasn't until the sun shone through my window that the clown disappeared. I just blinked, and he was gone. I didn't want to acknowledge it as real. I just wanted to dismiss it for what it was, a nightmare. But the bruises on my neck would allow me to do no such thing. Yet if I went to a doctor, I'd certainly be labeled insane. Not to mention that if I called in sick so early in my career, I'd lose my job. So I went in to work made up some tale of getting jumped by a vagrant to explain the bruises and tried to get on with my life. Which was very difficult considering I was met by a different creature the following night. A large spider. And the night after that, machete murderer, and so on, which is what led me to begin drinking. My first visit to the local bar was two weeks after the first... visitor. The only sleep I'd had in that time period were the few minutes at a time I was able to get away with at work, and forty minutes during lunch. 
Of course, at first, I didn't take it lying down. No technology would work when they were present, and they only appeared during night hours. But I never had time to sleep during the day. I thought of everything a sensible person would think of. I thought about moving, about trying to sleep other places. A visit to a hotel yielded negative results. Getting an exorcism, and even briefly about ending my life. Those weeks were hell, and I was quickly losing motivation to push on. But on my first night of trying to drink the trouble away, almost as soon as I entered the bar, I became a cliché. I fell in love. The bartender, a soft-spoken, lanky brunette, Kathleen, was the most attractive woman I'd ever seen. So, of course, I made a fool of myself trying to talk with her. I was sleep-deprived and drunk, yet for some reason, she took an immediate liking to me. She was quick to laugh at my poor jokes and didn't seem off-put at all by the excessive complaining I did about my job. Even drunk, I managed to avoid bringing up my nighttime companions. Although by the end of the first night with her, I felt as if I could trust her with that knowledge. But I held off. It's probably a good thing I did, too, seeing as how she asked for my phone number before I left the bar. That night was the first time I'd been happy in weeks. I'd almost let myself believe all of my problems had gone away. A pretty girl and a stomach full of beer was all it took for me to let my guard down, and I paid for it. That night, I climbed into my bedside chair with no intention of sleep. I'd let my guard down, but I had in no way allowed myself to forget the creatures in the night. Even if I didn't mean to sleep, it became quite difficult to focus on staying awake when my mind wandered to thoughts of Kathleen. Minutes... Maybe hours passed as I replayed our conversation. I'm not a witty person when I'm sober, and I'm even less witty while drunk. The last thought I had before losing the battle with my eyelids was that she must have been twice as drunk as I to be laughing at my jokes. Searing pain in my legs woke me up screaming. The normal light of my window was blocked by a hazy figure, tall, with jagged arms that bent in too many places, and the entirety of its skin writhed with needle-like protrusions. I figured that part out because they were being used to shred the skin on my legs. Not ashamed to admit that I screamed bloody murder. It didn't deter the nightmare at all. It just leaned further over me and reached towards my face with a razored tendril. The movement was slow and mocking. It was drawing out the anticipated pain. I was so focused on that one tendril, it almost drowned out the pain in my legs. The creature slowly drew closer, and it towered over me as it finally connected with my cheek. It was only a pinprick of pain. The moment the monster touched my face, my phone buzzed and lit up. Once I could see it, and its entire horrifying figure, the nightmare receded to its spot in the corner. My floor was soaked 
with the blood seeping from my legs, and probably urine as well. But all I could think to do was grab at the phone. I didn't understand at the time. Normally nothing electronic worked when the nightmares were watching me, yet the phone lit up when I hit the button, and in the screen flashed a text from Kathleen. Sorry to text you so late. I couldn't sleep. I know that you're probably in bed, but I couldn't wait to ask if you'd like to have dinner sometime. I called her. I was completely incoherent, sobbing and raving. I told her about the monsters in my room, the cuts on my legs, and how she just saved my life, all at two in the morning the night after I met her. But she did not hang up. She listened. And bless her perfect heart, she asked, Where do you live? I'll, I'll come over. I told her to let herself in, and when she arrived, I don't think she expected me to actually have torn up legs. There was a lot of freaking out and rushing around, and I imagine I lost a lot of blood, which is why it all seemed so hazy. But I know that Kathleen forced me to go to the hospital. Or rather, she called an ambulance without consulting me, but... I'm glad she did. I woke up in the hospital to her smiling face. I was so confused. Where... where am I? The hospital. You've been asleep for two days. Asleep? The words sounded so strange coming out of my mouth. Sleep was something for normal people, a fairy tale far beyond my grasp. Sleep was something that came in fifteen-minute flashes here and there, never in hours. Yes, asleep. They're still trying to figure out what happened to you. They think some psycho broke into your apartment. But I'm glad you're okay. I've been with you the whole time. Why? Far from the best choice of words to show gratitude. Why are you being so nice to me? Kathleen gave a tight grin in response. You just seem so lost. When I first saw you, it was like you were calling out to me for help. I don't really understand it either, but... I already feel so connected to you. Oh, was all I replied. But in my defense, I was still groggy. Thank you so much. We were quiet for a while until she softly asked, Hey, when you called me, you said I saved your life. What did you mean? The memory of the creature flashed through my mind, and I must have grimaced. She glanced down at my cuts. You weren't planning on killing... on suicide, were you? Did you do that to yourself? Oh, no, no, it's... well, it's, it's worse than that, I responded. I just... I have nightmares. For some reason, she didn't question that. Well, you're in no condition to be on your own. How about I spend the night with you and try to get rid of those bad dreams? She offered and then seemed to understand what she had just said. Whoa, whoa, I, I, I mean just be there, nothing sexual. No, 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 I cut her off. The thought of how she might react to the monsters or how they might react to her, I wouldn't have it. You've done so much, and I still don't understand why, to be completely honest. 
But I don't want you to get hurt by this. She placed a hand on my cheek, opposite to where the nightmare had prodded me. I'm doing so much for you because your eyes are the saddest I've seen. Whatever it is you're facing, it's time to stop trying on your own. I'm coming to your place once you get out of here. There was no arguing beyond that. The cuts on my legs were many, but not deep. So I was actually able to walk out of there on my own feet, with Kathleen refusing to let go of my arm. We made it back to my apartment, and I insisted upon cooking for her. Then, we simply sat at my little kitchen table and talked. We made small talk about everything and anything, yet there wasn't a single subject in which we had opposing views. She was the perfect girl, which is why it was so difficult for me to ask her to leave. Our conversation had been effortless and warm, but I shattered the mood. I... I need you to leave now. It's getting late, and you shouldn't be here overnight. She ignored the request. Ah, time for the meat of the matter. So what are these nightmares that would compel you to turn away a pretty lady offering to spend the night? I suppose I just didn't want her to leave. So I figured, screw it, and tried telling the truth. They're not really nightmares, they're monsters. I, I know, I sound crazy, and I probably am, but for the last few weeks I haven't been sleeping. There have been these things in my room at night, watching me, waiting for me to stop watching them. If I look away, they, they come for me. I was almost strangled, and now my legs... You're not lying, are you? Her question wasn't patronizing in the slightest. She genuinely believed me, which led me to believe that perhaps I wasn't the crazy one. But I no longer had the strength or desire to refuse her, as she said. Let's go to your bed, and we'll face them together. A few minutes later, and we were doing something that few adults had ever done before. Sitting in bed with a stranger they had just met at a bar, yet doing absolutely nothing other than going to sleep. I made sure to leave every light in the room on, and Kathleen didn't seem to mind. Not like it mattered, though. As soon as we both settled down under the covers, the lights flicked off on their own. Her breath caught at the same time as mine. The two of us slowly sat back upright in the dark room, and I had the unshakable feeling that I should not have allowed Kathleen to stay. My voice was a hoarse whisper. They control the lights. They don't let me see them. She remained silent as I followed suit, as it became clear that we were not the only ones in the room. An all too familiar rasping arose from the far corner. My first waking nightmare. The clown. She could see it, too. Kathleen's voice was faint, even though she sat so close. When did this start? When I moved in here and got a new job, I replied dimly. 
My blood ran cold as the clown let out its humorless chuckle, and my mind ran rampant with newly formed fears. It was one thing for me to face the monsters, at least they ignored me when I focused on them, but what if the clown attacked Kathleen? There are more, she pointed out. I kept my eyes plastered on the darkness of the room, and dim moonlight leaking through the shades illuminated the awful fact that Kathleen was correct. More creatures lined the walls of the room surrounding the bed, all staring at the two human occupants. What actually happened to your legs? She asked faintly. I was too absorbed in our surroundings to realize the oddity of the question. I fell asleep. One of them got to me. And with a sinking realization, I saw the very same buzzing outline of the needle creature that had torn apart my flesh. But Kathleen continued to press on. What stopped it? You. You messaged me. And you said one of them tried to strangle you. What stopped that one? Someone's headlights. I responded numbly as my eyes further adjusted to the darkness and revealed the four-foot tarantula clinging to one of the walls. More of the creatures appeared with every second, and all I could think about was the horrible things they would do to Kathleen if I didn't keep my eyes on them. Then one of them took a step forward. I whipped my head towards it, the machete murderer. But when I faced it, one of the other creatures drew closer. I couldn't watch all of them. Somehow Kathleen managed to keep talking. They started when you had a big change in your life, and human interaction made them go away. We need to make a run for it, I had replied, only half listening to her as the mob of nightmares closed in on the bed. There's never been more than one. I looked to my right, and the spider was no longer on the wall, but on the ceiling overhead. And when I looked back down, the needle monster was almost within arm's reach. No matter which way I turned, they managed to draw in closer. The clown stood at the head of the mattress, staring at both of us head on. All I could manage to do was whimper. You go. Maybe they just want me. She cut me off with a kiss. Her entire body weight flung against mine and pinned me against the pillows. My mind was a panic. I couldn't see a single nightmare, so I figured they must be about to pounce, but still she pressed against me, and I guess... I also kissed back. Might as well enjoy our last moments. But nothing happened. She broke away and we both drew in breath and then I gasped as I saw the empty bedroom around us. The lights flickered back on as she rolled back onto her side of the bed. How? You told me yourself, she replied with a relieved giggle. Interaction makes them go away, be it a stranger driving by or someone texting you in the middle of the night, or maybe the most intense kiss of my life. They're gone. It's all I could think. And then, how are you so amazing? I'm not... I'm really not. I get lonely, I do stupid things like call crazy drunks I just met, and I work in a bar to make a living. 
I'm anything but perfect. The monsters were gone. And I got the impression they weren't coming back. Not as long as Kathleen was with me. Now it was my turn to kiss her. And when it was over, I said, Well, you're perfect to me. She just grinned and curled up under the cover, somehow ready to go to sleep. Come on, you need some sleep. And for the first time in weeks, I was able to let my head sink to the pillow without worry. The end to a horrid chapter in my life, all thanks to the amazing bartender at my side. She was my hero. And I had to find a way to put it into words I needed to express my true gratitude. And it took a while, but I got it. I wrapped my arm around her and said, You're a dream come true. Well, that story was quite touching, if a bit more sappy than I care for. Perhaps he ends up becoming overly attached, too much of a codependent partner for his bartender's love. Then, as she pulls away, his psychic psychosis kicks in to cause even more terror to plague their lives. Or maybe they just live happily ever after. Sheesh. You're a damned buzzkill, you know that. Well, this next story is a poem. In fact, it is one of my favorites. It's about a boy who, like many children, dream of a life away from the restrictions imposed upon them by their parents. Of course, what parents might do out of love and concern for their children's safety could easily be seen as malign domestic fascism by the young, which might drive them to drastic measures, like answering the call of the mysterious children in the shadows on the wall. The shadows of Samuel Craven. The Shadows of Samuel Craven by Michael Whitehouse In the sleepy town of Windarm, a street where no one goes, a child of wondrous prying was deadened in crooked pose. His name was Samuel Craven, a boy no older than ten, sneaking out from the safety of his home, a reluctant one then. The breeze of the night engulfed him as he ran free and clear to his doom, to a place which never existed, but he'd found it, no less, in his room. At night the shadows would scurry, and paint pictures of streets on his wall, as he'd lie in his bed and observe a place where children stood tall. Each night the pictures grew stronger, as slivers of dark made the scene, a street of cobble and houses, glowing windows, thatched roofs, and oak beams. On his wall, shadowed children would scamper, playing late and loud as they pleased, while Samuel lay there in envy 
of the place he so wanted to be. For his parents seemed strict and distant, far removed from the freedom he yearned. And of course Samuel wished for an instance where the rules of grown-ups could be spurned. Night upon night he was beckoned by the children playing tag on the wall, and the rules of his parents rang harshly in his ears, in his soul, in him all. On the fifth night the picture froze sharply, and the shadows of children turned round to face Samuel Craven with wide grins in place, made of dark and of light, which was drowned. Come with us, dear Samuel, they whispered. You can play with us now in our street, and you never need worry about grown-ups again, for here parents and children shan't meet. Young Samuel did not have to answer, for he leapt from his bed with glee. Through the wall where empty eyes watched him, open-handed and whispering, Be free! As the thin shadowed hands of the children grabbed his own and pulled him within, the world turned gray to poor Samuel, and his vision began to dim. Welcome home, my dear little boy, said a voice cracked with age, wheezed and thin, and his sight was encroached by the darkness. Samuel saw what had spoken to him. A figure stood at the end of the street, something tall and spindly of limb, wearing rags of gray, dirtied fabric, and an absence of life there within. Its eyes were putrid and glassy, and its mouth gaped with rotten lament. Against those with joy in childhood, and of people and of time misspent. Come closer, dear Samuel, do not be afraid, for I am seeking little, nothing more than to keep you away from the grown-ups of that world you have found such a bore. Look at the children who stay here, said the figure with bony hands raised, and as Samuel shuddered with a chill in the air, he knew the grave choice he had made. For the children played not, so to speak, but were frozen in crooked positions. Like scarecrows warding off the unwanted, the figures prized acquisitions. Mouths stitched tightly in place, eyes pleaded and ears strained to listen, as the shrouded vagabond figure walked amongst the deadlocked children. They too once wished to run far away from those who were old and stern. And of course I granted that wish by making shadowed statues of them. The vagabond moved ever closer, and Samuel saw in its round opaque eyes there was nothing of love about them, only pain and a well of demise. As its rotten coughed upon garments ruffled quickly in the bleak night air, Samuel turned to face his bedroom, running fast to the safety held there. But his movements were quickly restricted by the cracks and creaks all around of the hands of petrified children, shadowed fragments of life now death-bound. Scared little Samuel struggled and cried out as loud as he could, but quickly his screams were muffled by fingers like rigid warped wood. Now is the time, 
said the vagabond, showing his teeth white and bled. While slithered hands gripped the boy in place, the figure held needle and thread. Darting in front of small Samuel, the needle glistened with delight, and the children forced a smile on his face with their hands withered and slight. As their fingers pulled at the corners of his mouth and prodded inside, Samuel cried in desperate terror, tasting charcoal and rancid skinned hide. The vagabond now simply reveled as he pierced helpless Samuel's top lip, pulling needle through skin and followed by thread before laughing and goggling on spit. Coldness now took young Samuel as his skin began to fade. Like the other children around him, life and hope reneged. I will seal up your lips and take your light, said the vagabond holding the needle, and add you to my own gaggle of souls filled with hate for those who are feeble. As the needle hovered and danced, Tears streamed down Samuel's face. To be back in his cozy bedroom, find his steps and simply retrace. That was all he could think of, but now nothing more could be done. For as his skin turned to shadow, and his eyes began to burn, the vagabond stared intently spit drooling from opened gaped lips and with one thrust forward the needle drove straight to extinguish the child's heart by eclipse howls of pain and anguish cut through the cold darkened street but it was not young samuel who yelled in pain it was the vagabond who had to retreat for standing shoulder to shoulder, dragging the figure with all of their might, were Samuel's parents emboldened by their son's cries for help in the night. They pulled at the creature's limbs, knocking needle from sordid hand, as the shadowed children creaked forward, following their master's commands. Take their light now, my children! said the vagabond, seething with hate. These grown-ups must be punished, stitch their lips, and seal their fate. Samuel lay on the cobble, crying and desperate for home, as the vagabond threw both his parents to the ground next to their son. They cradled their boy's head softly, and whispered, don't be afraid, as the shadowed children surrounded, open-eyed with fingers like blades. But looking at young helpless Samuel, something stirred in each shadowed face, of memories of home and of love, of a forgotten and once lived in place. The memory of family came flooding, like a tide of bitter regret, of sleeping in darkness for centuries and being snatched from warm, comfy beds. Slowly the children cracked onward as the vagabond closed in tight, yet not to assist their captor, but to stop him with all of their might. A sea of shadowed child fingers pulled and clawed at the rags of the vagabond once their master who'd sewn each of their stitchings and gags. Samuel's parents did not need to ask for one more second of time and grabbed their son as quick as they could fleeing the scene of the crime. As the figure tore down his children, each one of their stitchings pulled out, 
He rasped and he screeched with venom at the family who'd caused such a rout. His horde of children lay on the floor, wide-eyed and mouths ripped open, as he flung himself toward the three who'd left his street empty and broken. Panting and rushing and heaving, Samuel's parents flew to the edge of where the street now ended and the bedroom made safety its pledge. The vagabond soon quickly followed as the family leapt within to their house and the room they had chosen for their son to play and sleep in. As the figure drew ever closer, a seething wretch of the night, Samuel's mother leapt to the corner and simply turned on the light. No shadows were there to be feared of. No vagabond children or street. Nothing which spoke of the danger which their boy had taken to meet. The years moved on with Samuel, though he would never forget his mistake, running from those who loved him to strangers who'd promises make. And now Samuel is grown up, his daughter asleep in her room, as shadows and whispers spill over from the street, the vagabond's tomb. was a close one. The Vagabond sounds like a couple of boogeymen I know. In fact, I think it sounds like Frank. Franklin did have a bit of a drooling problem, and, and we haven't seen him around at our monthly card game for a while. Ah, well. Frank kind of smelled anyway. Well, I hope that helped, Dwell upon these stories and see if that doesn't help you drift off to a pleasant, dream-filled trip to slumberland. Or maybe a disturbing nightmare-filled trip to the other place. Well, until the morning comes, kitties, sleep sweet and sweet dreams. The Mad Catter presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2017 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or their simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Jason White at SoundCloud.com slash Angels dash of dash Despair. And Mew at soundcloud.com slash m-y-u-u Details can be found in the short notes. If you want to support this show, please go to www.patreon.com slash themadcatter For more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com slash Cheshire Hats or on Twitter at RealMadCatter. You can also download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hats. Well then, good night, kitties, and sweet dreams. (laughs) 